Amid reports of a widespread hunger strike over deteriorating conditions at Guantanamo Bay, we examine why the U.S. seems to have given up on closing the facility. You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansu. Attorneys representing detainees at Guantanamo Bay say most of their clients are on hunger strike as a result of deteriorating conditions at the camp. They say the protest has entered its fourth week. There are reports that some men are coughing up blood and losing consciousness. However, a public affairs officer at Guantanamo denies the reports. In an email to Al Jazeera, he says that of the 166 prisoners, seven are currently on hunger strike, and that all inmates are closely monitored for health, food, and water intake. Four years ago, U.S. President Barack Obama vowed to close down the facility. But the issue of what should be done with Guantanamo has since disappeared from the radar. Meanwhile, some human rights attorneys say the situation has actually worsened since Obama became president. Joining me now is retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Morris Davis. He's the former chief prosecutor at Guantanamo Bay. We also have with us Jennifer Daskal. She's currently an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center. She also served as a lawyer at the National Security Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. And we're joined by David Reams, one of the attorneys representing Guantanamo detainees. He returned from Guantanamo last week. And in fact, David, perhaps we can get an, a better idea of what the situation is right now at Guantanamo. How many people are on hunger strike right now? Camp 6 is where most of the detainees are held, probably about 130. My clients tell me that all but three or four are hunger striking, and those tend to be old and sick detainees. So you basically have a virtual, uh, unanimous uh, hunger strike, if you will. There are other detainees, but they are elsewhere. We put this to uh, the officials at Guantanamo Bay. We got this response from Captain Robert Durand, the Director of Public Affairs at Guantanamo. He said, quote, of 166 total detainees, currently there are seven detainees engaged in hunger strikes, which is about what we have averaged for the past year. A few detainees have engaged in hunger strikes for several years. Joint Task Force Guantanamo follows the Federal Bureau of Prisons protocols regarding hunger strike management and the involuntary feeding of hunger strikers. A lot perhaps to get into there, perhaps. But uh, David Reams, I mean, he, he, he seems to be denying your charges there. There were six or seven detainees who were on long-term hunger strikes before the current hunger strike. So in effect, he's simply denying that there is a current hunger strike. He's not counting men who haven't eaten in 35 days, men like my clients who've lost, clearly lost, 30 pounds or more. So when he, when he says there are, only, there are seven on hunger strike, you know that he is not referring to your client who, who is refusing food. That's right. Um, and I mean, there is some sort of protocol, apparently, with prisoners who refuse nine consecutive meals are classified as hunger strikers. Might this account for this discrepancy? I mean, is there some technical uh, detail that, that, that has to be taken into account before someone's officially well, the, classified? Or? These men would satisfy that criterion in spades. Uh, they've been without meals for 35 days. Um, and I think what's also striking about that statement is how routine hunger strike because seem even by uh, Robert Duran's own perspective. I mean, this doesn't seem to be, as a phenomenon, it doesn't seem to be anything that he's terribly surprised about. There have been hunger strikes by individual detainees over the years. This is the first general hunger strike. It's the first hunger strike that is so widespread and that involves virtually all of the men in the largest camp. So, so when did this begin and why did this begin? This began in early February uh, when the guards began very, very intrusive searches of the detainees' cells and signaled that they were going to search the men's Korans something that had not been done since 2006. The men consider the Koran a very holy book. I don't know whether most Americans, at least, uh, or Westerners can understand the depth of their devotion. They don't want the government to search their Korans. We put this to uh, Captain Duran. This is his response to that. 
We routinely conduct searches for contraband that could be used to harm guards, medical personnel, translators, instructors, attorneys or detainees. Our search procedures reflect our mission to treat detainees humanely. We respect both their religious and cultural norms with regard to the Quran, personal privacy and physical contact. David Reams. Well, I find it odd that he implies there might be contraband in these uh, Qurans. Uh, in light of the fact that they haven't been searching Qurans for six or seven years. I think that this is just basically a way of asserting power over the detainees now by new personnel at the base. Oh, so that it does coincide with some shake-up in, in the management of the camp? Then. My personal opinion is that it does. Has there been any official guidance on changes in regulations as regards personal belongings? I'm not aware of any, but here they're taking uh, they're taking uh, photos, letters that the ICRC passed along to the men from their families. Some uh, are losing their legal papers. Some are losing blankets. It seems to be without rhyme or reason. Every guard determines for himself what should be taken. Right. So, so this does actually, uh, Colonel Davis. I suppose this does. Um uh, connect to the fact that, I mean, is there a central rule book? Is there, is there a repository of information as to how the detainees should be, should be guarded? There is a rule book for Guantanamo, but it seems to get reinterpreted every time there's a new rotation of guards that come in. In fact, you know, as you may recall, in early February when the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed trial was ongoing and they were arguing in court over searches, during a break when they went back to their cells, they found that their cells had been searched and their legal papers had been taken which you know, Guantanamo said was just a routine. Well, that's the point. I said that it was almost as if they used the fact that the, they, they would not be in their cells because they were right. in the military commission to search through all their belongings and take, take belongings that were supposed to be protected, actually, by attorney right. and, and be part of attorney-client privilege. Of course, the, expl the official explanation was it was just a routine search. It just happened to take place while this issue was being litigated in the courtroom, but it was all pure you know, coincidence, according to the government. Um, just a few more questions, David, before I, before I open up the discussion a bit further. How, what is the health, um, what, what are the conditions of, for, for your um, clients right now then? What sort of health conditions are they in? Appalling. As I say, some clients have lost 30 pounds or more. I think that's the standard. Um, blood sugar levels drop <coughs> to dangerous levels as a result of uh, fasting. Uh, Men lose consciousness and have to be injected with sugar water, and then they zero back down and then zero back up. There are all sorts of very serious health effects, including simply the length of the hunger strike. Uh, when um, the public affairs officer says that they follow protocol on the force feeding of detainees, is that an issue in itself as, as well that we need to be examined? Um, to back up a bit, I would say the closest to regulations that there are is something called SOP, Standard Operating Procedures. But I think those afford a great deal of room for interpretation. Um, in terms of hunger uh, strike or force feeding, there's been a lot of uh, abuse and, and infliction of pain on the detainees over the years. I would think that it's become less deliberately abusive, but I think that it still remains very, very painful. The UN Torture Special Rapporteur, Juan Mendez, has been asking, as his predecessor did, for access to Guantanamo. As far as we know, he still isn't allowed in, is he? I believe he has not been allowed in, but he may not have been allowed in because a condition for him was meeting with the detainees and talking with the, detain the detainees. DOD is dead set against that by reporters, politicians, international investigators and so forth and until you talk to the men directly you're left with the de you're left with DOD's flat denials or attempts to minimize the situation and us their lawyers as a voice for them coming out of the camp they should be heard in their own voices right and this is all part of being an enemy combatant I suppose is that how they think they can skirt international the international laws of war on 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 access to the Red Cross and other people then? Or? I'll turn that over yeah. to Jennifer. The Red Cross does have access to the detainees, so right. the ICRC, but the ICRC does not publicly disclose any of the conversations right. that it has with the detainees. That's part of their mission is they talk directly to the government and oh, they I would see. lose access if they disclose that. The, so in terms of access, they're perfectly compliant with the laws of war and in fact, ironically, they, in, in this instance, they cite to some of the POW 
roles, or at least historically, to, about concerns about media access and, and protecting detainees' privacy as a justification for not allowing access. At least th that was the answer right. that we were given a long time ago when I was But, but the UN Special Rapporteur torture. on Torture has no particular legal standing then? Is that, is that, is that, what the, is, is that the position of the DOD then? And under remember? the laws of war, the UN Special Rapporteur right. has no special access to the detainees. Right. Um, as a policy matter, there's good reason why it would be prudent a good idea to, to, have to, <laughs> to provide more access. All right, so um, D David, you, you did send a letter then to the management, <laughs> to Rear Admiral John W. Smith, uh, the commander of Joint Task Force Guantanamo, and, and the staff judge advocate. Um, a pretty, I mean, a pretty powerful, serious letter. Amongst other things, you said the practices occurring today threaten to turn back the clock to the worst moments of Guantanamo's history. I mean, that's an immensely strong statement when we take into account what the worst moments of Guantanamo history are. Well, this isn't a matter of surmise. Uh, the officer in charge of Camp 6 actually said, we're going to go back to the 2006 rules, which were very restrictive and very harsh. He offered no explanation for doing that. I just think they want to show who's boss. Um, you asked for a response no later than Wednesday, March the 6th, 2013, from, from your letter of March the 4th. Did, did you receive a response? We haven't received a response directly. I suppose the only way that DOD or DOJ has responded is through these blanket denials and press releases. Uh, Colonel Davis, is there any explanation for why there was a decision in Camp 6, certainly then, to go back to a more, uh, a more harsher regime of, of, uh, of detention? I can't imagine. I don't know if it's a new rotation that's come in to uh, take over the guard duties or, or what happened. It, it would seem that you know, you'd want to be more lenient and compassionate rather than more harsh because you know Guantanamo has been going on for in excess of 11 years now the population's down to 166 a majority are people that we don't want to detain we'd like to get out of Guantanamo uh, there's a lot of world attention on it so you'd think we'd want to be on our best behavior and, and the, putting the best foot forward don't forget the president himself said that it was his Correct. wish to close it down so I just don't see the incentive yeah. for uh, trying to be more harsh rather than more compassionate Let's just remind ourselves then who else is at Guantanamo. Um, president Obama did promise to close it uh, on his first day as president in 2009. That has not happened. More than 779 men, all of them Muslims, have been detained at the U.S. military base in Cuba since 2002. 166 men remain in detention today. Of those, 86 have been cleared for release but remain imprisoned. 46 have been slated for indefinite detention because the U.S. government claims they can neither be prosecuted nor released. More than 22 men in Guantanamo today were captured when they were younger than 18 years old. Perhaps you can help us through some of those, those statements, actually. Um, cleared for release but remain imprisoned. Why is that? Well, just to be clear on the terminology, none of the detainees at Guantanamo have been cleared for release. They're cleared for transfer, and oh. that's an important distinction. And so the U.S. clears either through court orders or through mostly through its own internal process. Some detainees have been cleared for transfer, but it's transfer with according to the United States position, appropriate security guarantees and humane treatment guarantees. And so in some cases, there's a, there's a large number of Yemenis, for example, whom given the current climate in Yemen, this current administration does not, is not willing, there's a moratorium on transfers back to Yemen, given the current situation in Yemen. Um, not to say that that's the right... So is this for their own safety or because they, 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 it's thought that they might just disappear? And, or, I mean, what, 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 I, I didn't completely understand that then. So is, is it for their own safety that they're not going to Yemen? It's not. It, I mean, it, it's the concern is the U.S. And, and Congress has stepped in here as well. And Congress has demanded a number of onerous reporting requirements and other restrictions on who can be transferred back. So you have Congress saying, don't transfer somebody back if there's any risk of recidivism whatsoever, basically. And you have the executive who is, um, frankly, risk averse, concerned about releasing, transferring a detainee who ultimately then goes and joins right. the Al-Qaeda branch in, in Yemen, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula or another, or rejoins the fight in some way. But you know, it's an interesting dichotomy, though, because you know, we're saying that the Yemeni government is not competent to take responsibility for their detainees. But it's the same Yemeni government that we say gives us permission to go launch drone strikes and kill people. So it's a competent government in one respect and an incompetent government in another. And it doesn't seem you can have it both ways. As far as the issue of those who, the 46, who have been stated for indefinite detention, because the government says they can neither be prosecuted nor released, how did the government come to that conclusion, Colonel, Colonel Davis? And what legal authority do they have then to detain 
these men indefinitely. Well, I think there are a variety of reasons for why the cases aren't suitable for either prosecution or uh, for transfer or release. Uh, I think it's problematic that we've kept people for more than a decade in prison uh, without charging them with anything. I would, would hope if it was an American citizen being held by another country under similar circumstances that, uh, that we would object. But, you know, w w these people have no prospect of, uh, of, of being released uh, anytime soon, and we've, uh, we've justified a lot of this based on the fact that we're at war. Right. And in war, you have the right to detain the enemy for the duration of the conflict. So we're approaching an interesting point as the war winds down. That's been our justification for a lot of the things, you know, from Guantanamo to military commissions, indefinite detention, drone strikes, all these things have been premised on the law of war. And when the war ends, a lot, a lot of that basis goes away as well. I think that, I mean, to me, that is the key question. When is this conflict going to end? You right. had a very important speech by the former general counsel of the Department of Defense, Jay Johnson, back in November, talking about the fact that war should be an extraordinary state of affairs, and talking about that at some point, we're not there yet, but at some point, there ought to be a tipping point. In his words, we're not there yet. There ought to be a tipping point at which Al-Qaeda and its associated forces no longer pose a strategic threat against the United States. And you States can see interest. that actually occurring. I mean, a lot of the rhetoric and a lot of the policy we see seems to suggest this is an indefinite war. Well, you see two things. You see, I mean, I think there's two important facts that are happening right now. One, there's a lot of statements by President Obama on down to high-level leaders in the, in the Obama administration about al-Qaeda core at a minimum being effectively decimated or close to decimated or significantly destroyed. Um, and then you also have the fact that the United States is engaging in a pullout of, from Afghanistan. And so at some point, you're no longer going to have a, a central location where right. there's fighting forces on the, the ground. But in the meantime, the number of groups who are, like who are judged to be affiliated to al-Qaeda seems to be expanding, doesn't it? Well, it's unclear. I mean, the United States argues that the authorization to use military force, which is the authorization that is justifies the state of armed conflict that the United States sees it in, it covers both al-Qaeda and associated forces. And the administration has never stated publicly which groups it considers to qualify as associated forces, and courts have not yet ruled on this question either. As far as Guantanamo is concerned, David Dreams, as far as you can tell, is there any intention in the second term for President Obama to push for closure? I think he'd like to close Guantanamo. I think he's stymied. He stymies himself by saying he's not going to release Yemenis, which I, I interpret based on the chronology of events to have been a political move. He's not going to release the men who he's designated for indefinite detention or the ones he is going to prosecute, plus you have congressional restrictions. But at the end of the day, I find the terminology and the categories kind of meaningless, to tell you the truth, because everybody at Guantanamo is indefinitely detained. Um, what about those who are going through or receiving due process as we speak? Isn't, isn't this supposed to be... I don't think any of them has received due process. The military commissions were not set up to provide due process. They've never been declared to provide due process, and the same is true of American courts. Colonel Davis, how did President Obama fail on such a key campaign, campaign promise? Well, I, I, I agree with David. I think he sincerely intended to close Guantanamo, would still like to close Guantanamo, and I think in his heart knows that's the right thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, when he took office in 2009, well, let me back up a bit, 2008, if you recall, George Bush said he wanted to close Guantanamo, and so did John McCain. So it was a nonpartisan issue for a period of time. But when President Obama took office, you know, the objective was to make him a one-term president, which failed. But is it good enough just to, just to blame Congress, then, or is this a matter of leadership as, as well, well? I think it's both. I mean, I, I blame both. Congress wanted to make it difficult. If Obama was in favor, they were going to oppose. But the president didn't step up and provide leadership. I mean, he let the critics go out and uh, paint this as either you're with us or you're with the terrorists. And the public bought into that narrative. I think the public doesn't understand that the majority of the people at Guantanamo, we don't want to keep. Well, we have an ABC News Washington Post poll. Uh, this is during the 2012 campaign, though, that showed more than two-thirds uh, favor keeping Guantanamo open now. Only 24% think that it, it should, be, should be closed. Um, in, in addition, uh, Professor Dasko, uh, we, we now have the, the National Defense Authorization Act, which, which seems to have complicated matters as well. Which, it, does that effectively tie the president's hands when it comes to transferring prisons from Guantanamo? Perhaps you can explain that. So the, the National Defense Authorization Act does two things that makes it very difficult for the president. It imposes a number of hoops that the administration has to go through, including a number of certifications to Congress before it can transfer a detainee. It includes a blanket 
prohibition that can be waived in extraordinary circumstances on sending a detainee to any country where there's been any case of recidivism in the past. Um, that set of restrictions complicates significantly the transfer operations. And secondly, the National Defense Authorization Act also prohibits the government from transferring detainees into the United States, either for, for federal court prosecution or for continued detention. Uh, but then as far as the, you know, the optics certainly are concerned, uh, David Dreams, I mean, he reassigned, the Obama administration reassigned the man charged with closing down Guantanamo in January. Uh, yes. And then two years ago, President Obama did sign an executive order uh, requiring a review of detainees for periodic evaluation to see whether they should still be detained, but none of those have actually happened. I mean, you have to wonder how much, you know, I mean, if he's not even doing what he's supposed to be doing, perhaps. What, you know, well, quote. some of the particulars that you mentioned yeah. are uh, complicated, but the basic point is uh, that he has not shown leadership. He has run from any controversy. He cannot take a whiff of criticism on this. He has bigger fish to fry. He tried to bring the Uyghurs into the U.S. in the spring of April 2004, uh, 2009, fled when there was criticism, wanted to try the 9-11-5 in federal court, fled when there was any criticism. I just think that however sincerely in his heart he feels about closing Guantanamo, there are things that he feels more strongly about. And when we talk about, just to be clear, when we talk about closing Guantanamo, because there's this category of detainees that you spoke about who are deemed too dangerous to be transferred and ineligible for prosecution, um, incapable for prosecution, when we talk about closing Guantanamo, the plan, I think, all along had been to move some set of detainees to the United States where they would be in the exact same position in the United States right. of long-term detention, um, until right, so the end of the conflict. This is, where, this is where your argument actually comes in, which is quite interesting. We've only got about three minutes left, unfortunately. Professor Dusk, I mean, you say, okay, let's be pragmatic about this. So let's make this a model facility. It is a model facility, perhaps, compared to some supermax prisons. So let's now make sure this is a model, not just of detention, but also of, of justice, I suppose. Is that, is that your argument now, move, moving forward, and, and perhaps stop talking about closure of Guantanamo? I think we need to understand what we mean when we talk about closure. We don't mean transfer or prosecute, which is what I think many of the critics of Guantanamo would like to see happen. When the U.S. government talks about closing Guantanamo, they talk about moving some set of detainees to some other place where they continue to be, to be detained without charge. And so in the interim, until we get to the point where we really are at the end of the conflict, which is where I think we ought to be focusing on and talking about, we should make Guantanamo the best place that we can for the detainees who are still there. Colonel Davis, what, what, what would you make of that argument? No, I think that's right. Closing Guantanamo make, makes a nice bumper sticker, but closing it and just moving the people somewhere else, you've created a, a new Guantanamo. It's that underlying issue of indefinite detention, whether the law of war permits it when the war ends, and what you do with the people uh, when that justification goes away. So you know, just creating a new Guantanamo somewhere else doesn't really solve the underlying. So in the meantime, David Reams and make Guantanamo the best it can be. Does that, does that satisfy you? Well. It's better to be not worse than to be worse. But the whole question of closing Guantanamo and what it means, as Professor Daskal has said, are you closing the facility or are you abandoning the idea? The focus uh, of the administration and others is to move the facility, change the zip code, but perpetuate the unjust policies that still exist today. That's the problem with that plan. But to be clear, the administration has committed not to send any new detainees to Guantanamo. It has not done so. And just this last week, it captured the son-in-law of Osama bin Laden. He was uh, the U.S. He was transferred to the United States and brought back to federal court, where he's going to be facing trial for conspiracy. And that hopefully will be the way forward. Uh, although in the meantime, though, David Dreams, as far as you're concerned, there has been this des deterioration in conditions. Which deterioration also, and a response to it that is life-threatening for my detainee clients and the other detainees at Guantanamo. Professor David Dreams, thank you very much. Professor Jennifer Daskal, thank you. Uh, Colonel Morris Davis, thank you as well. And that's it from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find more information about the program. And we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net. Thank you.